I had just wrapped work on a Friday night when my wife Kara first told me about the ad. I don't know how long I can work for this guy anymore, I said to her, closing my laptop for the weekend. Alan? She replied. Yeah, he's such a prick. Everything's urgent and everything's a fire drill until he doesn't care about it anymore. You know what you should do? What? Kick his ass. I wish. But you know full well that I don't have a threatening bone in my body. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I said with a wink. Oh, that reminds me. Speaking of lovers, my wife said with a smile, pulling out her phone. Look at this. Taking the phone from her hand, I saw that she had saved a job posting. New reality series seeks married couples for chance to win once-in-a-lifetime prize. At first, I scoffed at it. Having been happily married for a few years now, and both of us gainfully employed, I was pretty confident that neither my wife nor I sought money or fame. We already had everything a couple could ever want. Why would we ever go on a reality show? I asked. Keep reading, Kara replied, pointing to the bottom of the posting. I did as she suggested. The winning couple will receive a once-in-a-lifetime chance to work with one of the best fertility doctors in the world to aid them in having a child. Okay, maybe we didn't quite have everything a couple could want. I looked at my wife. Enticing, yes. But I mean, what are the chances we'd actually get cast? Hey, you can't win if you don't play, right? Kara replied. And what other choice do we have? She had a point. We'd been trying to conceive for a few years, but no matter the approach, whether natural, IUI, or IVF, you name it, the outcome was always the same. It was the one thing we didn't have. The one thing, save for surrogacy or adoption, that money couldn't buy. Having a child of our own, and so... The next day, we reached out to the production company's nondescript email address. A couple days later, we heard back. And a week later, we found ourselves on a video call with a casting director, attempting to sell her on why they should choose us as one of the five couples competing in their pilot, and why we deserved the prize. But my wife and I both left the meeting thinking we botched it, each of us walking away with the same feeling that one gets after a flubbed job interview. And so, we both resolved to go back to our lives, back to being realistic about the situation, and even started looking into some adoption agencies. That is, until a week later, when Kara and I received an email from the production company, informing us that we were selected to participate in the reality show pilot. A few signed contracts, NDAs, and talent release forms later, and my wife and I were off on an all-expense paid trip to Los Angeles. I remember pulling into the parking lot of the production studio that first day, and finding it a bit strange that a TV show would be filmed in such a run-down, dilapidated warehouse. But I knew nothing about production, and chalked it up to budgetary constraints. And after all, we had already traveled too far, and there was too much on the line to turn back now. Upon entering the building's lobby, we were immediately welcomed in by the show's producer, Phil, whose warm greeting through his medical mask quickly turned sour. You're late. Literally the last couple to arrive. Hurry, hurry. Follow me. We're about to start. I thought it a bit rude, and noticed a concerned look wash over Kara's face. But then I remembered it was our fault, after all, that we underestimated L.A. traffic so I bit my tongue. Phil then confiscated both of our cell phones before escorting us out of the lobby, down a long hallway, around a corner, and into a massive lounge lit by professional lights with five couches scattered about, four of which were occupied by other couples who were sitting there, patiently waiting, when we finally entered the room. So sorry, I called out to them while simultaneously waving hello as I sat down in one of the love seats. Thanks for your patience, Kara added, as she took a seat beside me. But our peers and competitors didn't even have a chance to react, as Phil suddenly ran into the room with a similarly masked production crew of about ten individuals and got right down to business. I thought it strange that they were all masked, assuming that COVID regulations had long ended. But before I could dwell on the details too much, Phil yelled out, All right, places people, sound, speed. A few masked sound guys yelled back as they hit record on their audio devices 
and aimed their boom microphones at the front of the room. Camera, Phil continued. Speeding! Several masked cameramen replied in unison, each carrying a broadcast camera on their shoulder. Slate, Phil added, as a masked production assistant ran up to the front of the room, where there was a set of two doors on the far wall, and a door to the side that must have led off stage. He then opened his clapboard for all of the cameras and microphones to see and hear. I wondered why they hadn't filled out the section on the clapboard where the first take would go, but my thoughts were interrupted by the sound of it clapping. Clap! Then Phil gestured to what must have been the director, who was hanging back in the shadows, his features hidden in the dark, outside of the set's bright lights. Action! The director yelled out for all to hear, and then there was silence. All of us couples looked at each other with a smile, literally on the edge of our seats, when suddenly we heard the voice of a middle-aged man ring out over the speakers that had been mounted to the ceiling of the lounge. Ladies and gentlemen, who's excited to make history? The cameras turned to the ten participants, including Kara and myself, and we all immediately started clapping and whistling before they turned back to the man. I'm your anonymous host, four-time husband and five-time divorcee. The group erupted in laughter, cheering him on as they looked up at the speakers. And you know what? I'm not proud of that. Cause, much like you, deep down inside, I want to love and be loved. To have the fortitude, the patience, and the will to fight on through good times and bad. All in the name of love. Which is why I've brought you all here. Yes, you. Give yourselves a round of applause, he said, before pausing to allow us all to react. And so we did, all the couples clapping and smiling. Yes, I'm here, hosting and watching remotely, to learn from the five happily married couples before us, what the secret is to persevering through the challenges that life throws our way, to see what ends you'll all go to in support of your marriage, and if you'll do... Anything for love. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Anything for Love. Everyone let out a nervous laugh but kept applauding anyway. And now, it's time for the rules. In this reality competition, the first of its kind, you'll be split up into two groups, five men and five women, and separated from each other for the duration of the game. Over the course of the show, both teams will compete in four challenges, with each challenge resulting in one loser, who will be promptly eliminated. At the end of the game, the winning player from each team will be revealed. If those two players are not members of the same couple, then no one wins. But if those two players happen to be members of the same couple, they win the game. And a once-in-a-lifetime prize, the chance to work with one of the best fertility doctors in the world to aid them in having a child. So before we begin, let me ask you this. Are you prepared to do anything for love? His voice blasted out from the speakers with so much enthusiasm and so much energy that in that moment, every single one of us hopped up out of our seats and began cheering and clapping. Eventually the applause faded and our host continued. Now, will the men please line up on the left side of the room and the women on the right? The couples did exactly as he asked, and when we had finally split up into two groups, men and women, our host simply said, Now, good luck! And I can't wait to see who makes it to the end. Suddenly, the two doors at the front of the room opened, and each group was escorted by a masked production assistant through one of the doors, separating the husbands from the wives, until that fateful moment at the end of the show, when only the two winners will be reunited. For the first couple games, I didn't know where they took the wives, or what kind of challenges my own wife was facing. All I knew were the games they presented to us husbands. Games that were, let's just say, utterly fucked. As all five men entered the room for the first game, we all saw before us a massive open factory space that had been adorned with only one simple piece of art direction at its center, a small wooden table. Will the contestants please make their way to the table? The host called out over this room's ceiling-mounted speakers. We did as he said, as the masked camera crew followed us to the center of the room. 
The rules of game one are simple. In marriage, you must sometimes sacrifice a piece of yourself for the greater good. Today that sacrifice is your wedding ring, but not just your wedding ring, your entire ring finger. The five guys and myself all turned to one another and chuckled, assuming he was kidding. But suddenly, a door opened into the factory, and a masked crew member proceeded to walk over to the table holding a steak knife. He didn't say anything and simply stared at us through his mask, as the host continued. The last person to cut their finger off, or the first to give up, is the loser, and will be promptly escorted from the premises. What the fuck? I thought to myself, realizing the host wasn't kidding. Wait a minute, a few of the men mumbled. But one of them, the most obnoxious in the group, could not have been less afraid, puffing out his chest and yelling into a camera. Fine, I'll go first. I ain't afraid. He then slammed his hand down on the table, clenching his fist in a way that only exposed his ring finger. There was a brief moment of silence until... Suddenly, the masked crew member grabbed the husband's hand and brought down his blade so hard that it cut the man's finger clean off, blood spraying all over the table. It took the arrogant man a moment to process what had just happened, before he started screaming in pain, a scream that turned into a maniacal laugh as medical staff ran over to tend to his wound. Meanwhile, the rest of us guys looked on in horror as we saw blood pouring from his hand and realized we were next. The wounded husband then looked directly into one of the cameras and defiantly said, that was nothing, before turning back to us and asking, come on, who's next fellas? Two more of the men begrudgingly followed suit, each of their ring fingers being severed from their hands, leaving just myself and one husband left. We were both shaking in fear, but the other guy was terrified that he started begging the producer for a way out. Wait. You can't be serious. We really need to do that. Please, please don't make me. The show is called Anything for Love, Phil replied. And you signed paperwork that warned you things like this would come up. I didn't read that, the nervous man yelled back. But before he even had a chance to consider participating, I must have accidentally leaned on the table with my hand. Wait, the nervous man yelled out, but it was too late. Before either he or I noticed, the masked man had already amputated my ring finger, blood spraying everywhere as I let out a great scream that echoed throughout the factory. And as the medical staff ran over to me, just as they had done for the others who had gone before me, I heard the host's voice on the speakers again. Congratulations, gentlemen. Four of you have shown that you'll do anything for love, while the fifth did not have what it takes, and must now return home. And like that, a couple masked production assistants grabbed the nervous man by the shoulders and escorted him out of the room. It was in the aftermath of that first game that I realized the title of the show, Anything for Love, was not just a play on words, but the literal description of what we would need to do to win. And then, the host continued, Will the remaining four husbands please walk through the open door and into the next room? We did as he asked. On the way there, I looked down at my missing finger, its stump wrapped in gauze, and couldn't help but wonder if Kara had also been forced to make the same choice, and if she had gone through with it. When we entered the second room, we all saw another giant warehouse space, except this time, instead of being sparse, it was completely overgrown with shrubs of thorny vines, separating where we stood from the other side. Love is both a rose but also has thorns, the host called out over the room speakers. It can make you feel euphoric pleasure, but at the same time extreme pain. In game two, you'll need to prove that you can overcome that pain to get to the other side and make it to game three. The last person to crawl through the thorns, or the first person to give up, will be promptly eliminated from the show and removed from the premises. Will you do anything for love? The game starts now. The four husbands all looked at each other, then back at the thorns, then back at each other, before the arrogant man who was standing beside me made me a proposition. Let's team up. If we follow the same path, we can take turns. One of us pushing forward for a while, then the other, 
and it'll save us half the pain. But I didn't like the idea of cheating or supporting such an asshole, so I politely declined. Sorry, man. Fine. Have it your way, idiot. I don't need your help. I was just trying to help him out. The arrogant man said to one of the cameras, before he turned around and charged into the thorns. The rest of us husbands, including myself, still in shock from what had happened in the first game, and clenching our wounded hands, looked at each other, and then back at the production crew. But a group of them were standing behind us, ready to push us into the thorns, should we decide not to comply. So we all proceeded to follow the arrogant husband into the thorns, and began a race, through what felt like a football field's length of sharp vines, each of us doing our best to avoid what we could, but inevitably getting scratched over and over and over again, to the point where our bodies were covered in blood. And when I finally crossed the finish line, and stepped out of the thorny shrubs bloody and exhausted, I was relieved to find that only two husbands had beat me there. The arrogant man, of course, and another. We all looked back to find the fourth poor soul still halfway through the shrubs, his clothes caught in the thorns. Wait for me, he called out, but it was too late. Congratulations, winners, the host's voice called out over the speakers. You've proven you would truly do anything for love, and can proceed on to the next game. And as for the loser, please remove him from the game. Then, a couple crew members wearing rubber suits and carrying shears cut their way through the thorns, freed the fourth husband from the thorns, and escorted him out of the factory as the three remaining husbands left the second room and entered the third. My thoughts once again returned to my wife and wondered whether she too was faced with the same challenge and had made it through the thorns. Game three is where things escalated. When we entered the next factory, I saw three beds in the center of the room, each with a TV next to it. Remaining contestants welcome to the semi-final challenge. The host bellowed out over the room's speakers. Will you each please choose a bed? The three of us did as he asked, and walked to the center of the room, each of us standing in front of one of the beds. Then, a door opened, and three masked women emerged, making their way to the center of the room, and each lying down on one of the beds. The rules of game three are as follows, he continued. You simply have to sex with the stranger before you. The arrogant husband looked at me and smiled, while watching your partner do the same. Suddenly, the three TVs turned on, each displaying our wives in the very same situation, and lying on each of their beds was a masked man. First off, we assure you that the women and men before you complied consensually and have been tested for STDs. So the test of this game is not about morality or safety, but fidelity. Would you cheat on your significant other for the greater good of the relationship? The last couple to have sex or the first to refuse will lose, while the others will proceed on to the final challenge. I looked at my wife on the TV screen, relieved that she had made it this far, but started in shaking fear of what we both have to do to win. Meanwhile, the arrogant husband started unclipping his belt button and turned to one of the cameras. You call this a semi-final? My wife and I are in an open relationship. Bring it on. While the third man simply stared at his TV screen, sweating and pacing, clearly terrified to go through with it and watch his wife do the same. The game begins now, the host called out. As the arrogant man began to have sex with the woman on his bed, his naked body still littered with fresh scratches from the thorns, I thought about trying to escape. But then I saw the timid husband, and realized his hesitation was an opportunity for me to make it to the next round. And so, I too removed my clothes and exposed my wounded body, crawling into bed with the masked woman, as my wife did the same with the masked man. Before long, it was over. The arrogant man laying there naked and smiling into one of the cameras, while I, also naked, hung my head in shame for what I had just done. I looked at the TV screen and saw my wife put her clothes back on too. We had both made it. The same could not be said for the nervous man and his wife, who both stayed true to their values, neither engaging in the act, before masked crew members promptly escorted them out of the factory. And then there were two. 
Well, two couples, that is. Myself against the arrogant man, my wife against his. Masked production assistants then brought myself and my competitor into the room where the final challenge would be held. It, much like the first room, was completely bare, save for a dinner table at its center, where two plates and sets of utensils were set out. Finalists, welcome to the fourth and last challenge. Will both contestants please take a seat at the dinner table? We followed his instructions, as we had done previously, and sat down at the table, before a couple production assistants ran over and helped us tuck bibs into our shirts. The rules of Game 4 are perhaps the most simple of all. You'll be presented with an item that you must eat. The first to finish eating it is the winner. The host said over the room speakers. That's when a door opened and two masked PAs came out holding trays and began rushing them over to us. As they approached us, I began to panic, knowing that whatever it was that they were about to present to us would likely even be more terrifying than anything we had encountered in the previous games. Sometimes you have to break a heart to win another. The host called out, In this challenge, the item you'll need to eat is... At that exact moment, the two PAs each removed a pair of tongs from their pocket, uncovered their tray, and placed the item on our plates. A human heart, I gasped, and nearly threw up in my mouth as I saw the disgusting bloody organ lying there on my plate. May the best husband win! Good luck, the game starts! Now! For a minute, I hesitated, disgusted by the challenge set before me. But then I thought about what was on the line, and saw the arrogant husband immediately biting into his heart, blood pouring down his face. I hurried to catch up, briefly fumbling my own heart, before chomping into it and attempting to eat it as fast as I could, as blood sprayed all over my own face. But the arrogant husband had gotten a head start, and was moving too quickly. No matter how fast I ate it, it was becoming clear that if nothing was done, he would surely beat me. So, not knowing what else to do, I slammed what was left of my heart onto the plate, removed my bib, stood up, and proceeded to tackle the arrogant man out of his seat, sending his heart sliding across the concrete floor. What the fuck are you doing, man? He asked, likely surprised that I was capable of such an act. I'm doing what needs to be done for love, I replied before pummeling him over and over in the face with my fist as I channeled my innermost frustrations, ranging from the traumatic experience we had just gone through, the arrogant husband's obnoxious behavior throughout the game, years of belittlement from asshole boss, and my wife and my countless failed attempts at getting pregnant over the years. I kept pummeling him until he had completely shut the fuck up and was simply mumbling incoherent words his face a bloody pulp, blood bubbling out of his mouth. I then stood up, walked back to the table, sat down, put the bib back on, and took the last bite of my heart. Congratulations, you've proved that you'll truly do anything for love and have won the show. Please remove the loser. Rather than celebrate, my mind once again returned to my wife, worried about her well-being and wondering if she too had mustered up the courage to eat the heart, and had become the winning wife. A couple masked production assistants then ran over and dragged the arrogant husband away, as he simply stared at me in shock. I looked down at my hands, which were still covered in blood, then up at one of the cameras, which was now right up in my face. How do you feel? Phil asked, prompting me to speak to the camera. But I couldn't bring myself to speak any words. I tried to think of something to say, but before I could, a door opened, and the masked PAs grabbed me by the arms and escorted me out of the last room and into an adjacent hallway, which led to a huge set of double doors. Winners, the host said over the hallway speakers. You stand here before us victorious, each of you on one side of the doors. Now it is time to find out if the person on the other side is your partner. And if you both had what it takes to do anything for love. I took a deep breath, expecting the worst, expecting to see the arrogant man's wife on the other side. After all that, but when the doors opened, I simply saw my wife standing there on the other side. We ran to each other and embraced. 
both of us missing our ring fingers, littered in scratches, emotionally exhausted, and with faces and hands that were covered in blood. Congratulations, the host continued. You're the winners of anything for love. Both crying, we smiled at each other, but our smiles quickly turned into looks of sadness. We'd won. But at what cost? I wondered, before the thought was overshadowed by that of the once-in-a-lifetime prize that awaited us. The producer, Phil, then brought us into yet another room, where we met a doctor, his face covered by a surgical mask, and both shook his hand. When you two showed up late, Phil began, I never thought you'd be the ones to win, but you did, so we stand by our promise. After you return home, you'll be contacted by the doctor, who will provide you with the guidance and resources to hopefully have a baby of your own. That part is obviously not guaranteed. Thank you, my wife replied, clearly torn by saying those words. Understood. Thank you. I added, also torn, before realizing that the camera crew didn't follow us into the room with the doctor. But can I ask, why aren't you filming this part? Oh, our audience only cares about watching the games, Phil replied with a chuckle. Audience, but we just filmed it. Oh yeah, we were live streaming the whole time. I thought it was just a pilot. Who was watching? The subscribers. Who are they? A very small, very privileged group of people who can't be bothered by pedestrian entertainment. They desire something more. Elevated. Will this ever be a real show? This? Of course not. Phil laughed. No one else will ever watch this again and no one but the small group of contestants and this crew will ever know of what went on here. What happened to the other couples? Oh, they're fine. Aside from missing fingers and being a little physically and emotionally scratched up, we'll do with them exactly what we'll do with you. Drop them off somewhere just far enough away that after we give them their phones back, if they choose to call the police or tell anyone about this place, by the time they come here to investigate, They'll find this factory abandoned, without a trace of what went on here today. The same goes for you. By the way, we better get you ready to go. Your car will be arriving any minute now. Neither my wife nor myself had the energy to conjure up a reply. Thank you again for playing, Phil said through his mask. And on behalf of the subscribers, please enjoy your prize. He then led us out down a long hallway, through a back door, and into an alley where a car was waiting to take us away. The chauffeur will provide you with your phones upon your arrival. An hour or so later, the driver pulled over on the side of a highway and let us off, handing us our phones just as Phil had promised. But rather than call the police, we just stood there for a while, still horrified by the terrifying experience we had just been put through. And ultimately, we decided that since we had won, it'd be best to leave it alone. We hitched a ride back home, and sure enough, about a week later, we received a call from the doctor. And less than a year after that, my wife gave birth to our baby boy. Sometimes I think back to that day and the terrible games they set before us, and wonder if my wife and I went too far to win. But then I look at my newborn son, and all the doubt, all the shame, all the horror, washes away. And as for the subscribers... Every once in a while, when a car drives suspiciously slow past our house, or I get the feeling that my baby monitor might have just moved on its own, I wonder if they're still watching us, and if this is just the next episode of their reality show. I think we're lost. I edged the car along, looking for Rosebud Lane. But all I saw were rows and rows of the same cookie-cutter suburban house, crammed in next to each other, going on forever. Sighing, I pulled over at the curb. Can you check the GPS? Sure. As he pulled out his phone, I stared out the windshield. Even though it was a sunny, beautiful day, the neighborhood was a ghost town. Nobody walking their dog on the sidewalk. No kids playing in the street. I glanced around at the houses, and though it was hard to tell from the reflections on the windows, it looked like the curtains were drawn. Dave sighed next to me. I don't think is right. What do you mean? He handed me the phone. The app showed our location, in the middle of the woods. 
I zoomed out a bit, but no suburbs showed up. Whoa, that's weird. I pulled out my phone, but the same thing happened. Little blue dot in the middle of the woods. The closest road was the two-lane highway we'd pulled off of. Guess this is a really new development. Google Maps was almost always accurate. But if the houses had just been built, maybe the software hadn't caught up yet. They certainly looked very new overlapping gables. Big windows with no shutters. All neutral colors. The grass perfect, without muddy tracks from dogs or kids. The white siding so crisp and pristine, it almost glowed. The windows shiny as a mirror. I hated that sterile, almost uncanny look of new houses. Like they'd just been copied and pasted out of a video game and plopped down in the earth. No personal touches, no wear and tear, no character. Just sterile and empty and perfect. Maybe you should call Megan, I said. Dave glanced at the clock. I don't want to interrupt the shower. Yeah, but we're lost and the GPS isn't working. He sighed. If we don't find it in ten minutes, I'll call her. That was Dave for you, always thinking of others. Which was nice, of course, until it got to these kinds of things. He'd rather waste our time driving around aimlessly than give Megan a quick call for fear of being rude. It was always like that with him, but whatever. They say pick your fights and this wasn't important enough to go to battle over. I continued crawling down the street past more and more identical houses. But just as I was thinking, maybe it should force him to call Megan. That this was a fight worth choosing, I saw it. A turn up ahead. I sped towards the intersection, hoping the little green sign said Rosebud Lane. But as we got closer, my stomach dropped. What the hell? It was blank. It was just a green rectangle of metal. No text on it whatsoever. Wow, someone fucked up, Dave laughed. They had one job. Do you think I should turn? Wait. Let me pull up the GPS. The car idled on the corner as I waited for Dave to pull out his phone. Nah, still in the woods. I guess turn on it, yeah. I flicked on my blinker and turned onto the unnamed street. More cookie-cutter houses with curtained windows. All painted a perfectly neutral beige with white trim. Even the front lawns looked identical. Three shrubs along the porch and a big hydrangea on the garage end. There were no cars in any driveways either, just like the previous street. I wonder if they're so new. Some of them haven't even been moved into, just standing empty. For some reason, the thought sent a chill down my spine. How weird would it be to live in this neighborhood surrounded by empty houses? I'd hate to live here, I muttered. It'd be nice to have something brand new, though. Not having everything break all the time. But every single house looks exactly the same. I shook my head. I bet they have a super strict HOA. Probably. We continued up the road. It seemed like the houses stretched into infinity, disappearing into the light fog. What was it, again? Number 52? Yep. I slowed the car, looking for mailboxes so I could check the house numbers. But the houses didn't have mailboxes. I guess they must have one of those communal ones, I thought, like apartments and townhouses have. But the houses didn't have numbers on the front doors, or the porches either. So weird. We continued driving, but I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling. Identical houses, extending to infinity, like someone had just copy-pasted them on a computer screen. I let out a sigh and stared out at the road, looking for signs of life, individuality, anything. And then, finally, through the gloom and mist, I saw a smudge of color, a stop sign. Oh good, we'll see what street we're on, I said. But as we approached, my stomach twisted, my heart pounded in my chest. There wasn't an intersection, or even a crosswalk. There was no actual reason for cars to stop, yet the stop sign was still there. And there was another one, on the other side of the road, telling cars in the oncoming direction to stop, too. There's no reason for a stop sign to be here. Maybe it's like an accessibility thing. Like the person who owns that house is blind. So everyone needs to stop here so they don't hit them. Does that kind of thing even exist? 
I mean, great if it does, but I've never seen that. He shrugged. I think we should turn around. Let's just continue a little bit, Dave replied. In like five minutes, if we don't find it, we'll turn around. I don't know why I listened to him. I guess it's because, logically, I knew there wasn't much risk to driving around some weird neighborhood. It wasn't like we were wandering around in the middle of the woods, where we could get lost or die of dehydration or get eaten by a bear. It was 1 p.m. in the afternoon, and we were driving down a suburban road. But the instinctual part of myself, the part that evolved over hundreds of thousands of years, that prevented humans from going extinct long ago, was screaming. There is something wrong here. Get out. Get out. Now. I drove forward, glancing in the rearview mirror. The stop sign lingered there, its bright red almost unnatural against the gray gloom of the sky. Over the next few minutes, we didn't get any closer to finding Megan's house. There were no street signs, no mailboxes, no indication of where we were going. Even the car's compass seemed messed up as it switched from north to west a few times, even though we appeared to be going in a straight line. I finally pulled over to the side of the road and pulled out my phone. I'm just going to call Megan, Dave said finally, breaking the silence. Thank you, I snapped back, unable to keep the annoyance out of my voice. After a moment, Dave shook his head, not picking up. All right, let's just go home. But we told her we'd be there. I sighed and stared at him. Okay, so what do you want me to do? We're lost. GPS isn't working and she isn't picking up. He paused, glancing around. Maybe we should ask somebody. Who? There's no one here. Maybe knock on a door? My eyes widened. That's, that's weird. Look, let's just knock on a door and ask. If they don't answer, we'll give up and go home. I puffed out a breath. Fine. I pulled over to the curb. We got out and started up the driveway. It was no longer bright and sunny. The sky was a uniform, overcast gray. And the place was so... quiet. No voices, no cars passing by, no dogs barking, just our footsteps on the pavement. We walked up to the front door. When I didn't see a doorbell, I raised a fist and knocked. Thump, thump, thump. No footsteps or barking from inside. I don't think anyone's home, I told Dave. Just wait for a second. The address is definitely 52 Rosebud Lane, right? I'm like 99% positive, but I'll check. Dave pulled out his phone and scrolled. Yep. A minute went by. I knocked one more time. Then I leaned over and peered through one of the windows next to the door. Wait, what? The layout of the house was really weird. The staircase was plopped in the middle of the foyer, with empty space on either side. Beyond it, in the kitchen, there was a floor-to-ceiling tower of cabinets. Not connected to a counter or anything, just there. There was a painting on the wall of a woman standing on a rainy city street, but her eyes were drawn in upside down. What the hell? It felt like I was looking at an AI-generated image. Something made by a machine, trying to replicate what a house was supposed to look like inside, without any understanding of the function of stairs or cabinets or human behavior at all. Look, I said, motioning Dave over, but he didn't share my sense of unease. Instead, he laughed. Wow, whoever designed these houses was an idiot, he whispered. Can we go now? Yeah, okay. We headed back towards the car. As I walked around to the driver's side, though, I felt the hairs on the back of my neck prickle. The familiar feeling of being watched. I whipped around, but all I saw was the row of beige houses staring down at me with their dark, shiny windows. We should be there by now. You must have just passed it up, Dave replied. No, we didn't. It was almost 2 p.m. now. My stomach grumbled, my shoulders hurt. I just wanted to be back home, curled up under a blanket, watching YouTube, drinking tea. We only made one turn. But somehow, retracing our steps, we hadn't intersected it yet. We hadn't even passed the weird stop sign. Nothing looked familiar. Although, of course, everything looked familiar. Because all the houses were the same house. It must just be up a little further. I just want to be home, I whined, but a few minutes later, we passed something that we definitely didn't see on the way in. A house that was different. It was on the left side of the road, 
Everything about it was identical to the other houses, except for the porch railing. It was installed upside down, bolted into the underside of the roof, the banister at eye level. What the hell? I asked, slowing down the car. We both stared at the house. No builder or designer would make that kind of mistake. Would they? A few houses down, there was another house that was different. This time on the right. Two of the windows had been connected into one long, 15-foot-tall window that extended from the ground to the roof. What the fuck? Dave whispered. This isn't right, I replied, my heart pounding in my chest. And then I saw it. Just a few houses ahead of us was a mailbox. The only mailbox I'd seen on the street. And in small gold lettering were the words, 52 Rosebud Lane. Attached to the mailbox was a single pink balloon fluttering in the wind. No, there's no way. It's not. It doesn't make sense. There were no cars parked on the road. No voices or music coming from inside. No indication that there was a party going on except for that one balloon. I'm calling Megan. The phone trilled in his ear. And then she picked up. Dave, where are you guys? We're a little lost. We're in this development and... He paused. Do you have a pink balloon on the mailbox? No, she said, confused. It's the blue house on the hill, at the end of the cul-de-sac. Did you turn on Mountain Ave? It's a little hard to get here. She continued on, but I wasn't listening. I was staring at the house, specifically at the upstairs window, where a figure stood in the darkness watching us. I started the car and made a U-turn, tires screeching against the pavement. Dave turned to me, eyes wide. Someone's watching us, from that house. I stomped on the accelerator, the car rocketing down the suburban road. Slow down, Dave shouted. I glanced down, I was going 40. We can't, we have to get out of here. You're going to crash, damn it, slow down. But I did have to slow down, because up ahead, materializing out of the fog, was a stop sign, this time a crosswalk, and a cluster of school children crossing the road. I stomped on the brakes. The car screeched to a halt. Dave and I jerked forward, the seat belts locking us into place. My heart pounded in my chest. Then I looked up, and all the muscles in my body froze. It wasn't a group of school children. It was an amalgamation of arms and legs, backpacks and sneakers, tousled hair and ponytails, put together like some nightmarish jigsaw puzzle. No faces, no eyes. Just things that gave the illusion of a normal group of children crossing the street. I stared at the monstrosity twenty feet in front of us, partially veiled by fog, and then I switched the car into reverse. What the fuck? Call 911! I screamed at Dave. Now! We careened past the upside-down railing, the fifteen-foot window, the pink balloon. As we sped by, the houses got stranger and stranger. Chimneys leading up to the sky, floating gables, hardwood floors that spilled out into the grass. They say they can't trace our location, Dave shouted. Then I don't know tell them to go on the highway, Route 140, turn at, at Glenmont Road, and then make a right at the subdivision. He relayed that to them, but my heart was pounding. If we hadn't been able to retrace our steps, if they couldn't track our location, how would they find us? I slowed down slightly, glancing around the street looking for something, anything that I recognized. But all I saw were the windows, the curtains wide open in every single one, and people staring down at us. Although people was a stretch, everything about them was wrong. Their faces had all the wrong proportions, stretched and misshapen. Their eyes were set and upside down. They had far too many hands. People that looked like they had been crafted by some horrible AI, just like the houses they lived in. It's now almost 10 p.m. The sky should be dark, but it isn't. It's the same overcast gray color. We've made so many U-turns, I've lost count. Back and forth, back and forth. But it's never the same. The houses, the people are always different. Like the world is generating just for us each time we drive down it. Popping in and out of existence, the police called us. They tried locating us, again and again, but every time they failed. They insisted there were only acres and acres of forest where we described our location, 
I've used my phone to try to get other help. My parents tried to find us too. Nothing has worked. I only have 10% battery left. So I'm posting this online in the hopes that maybe someone, somewhere, knows how to escape this place. Maybe we'll finally get out. I'm so hungry. I'm so tired. All I want to do is stop the car and lie back in my seat. Drift off to sleep. But I'm afraid if I do that they'll get us. The not people in the houses. They're learning. With each hour they look more human. More like us. And they're getting bolder. I see children standing on the front lawn, still as statues. Women standing on the sidewalk with faces that almost pass for human. Men crossing the street in front of us. Whenever we drive by, they all start moving in our direction, like we're magnetic, a homing beacon. Dave is driving now so I can post this. Maybe I'll take a short nap. For a brief moment I won't be trapped anymore. I'll dream of being home, curled up with a cup of tea, watching TV with Dave. I'll escape this place, if only for an hour. I'm signing off now. Hopefully someone out there, somewhere, knows how we can escape. And if not... I'll have my dreams to comfort me for a little while. Tommy was a weird kid. Quiet, soft-spoken, almost timid. I was initially worried something was happening at home that was keeping him so walled off from the other kids. Until I met his folks at a parent-teacher's night at the school. His parents were a very nice young couple and just as eager to ask me about Tommy as I was to ask them. They were just as puzzled about Tommy's soft nature, and initially thought he was on the spectrum, although they had yet to have him tested. At recess, Tommy wouldn't interact with the other kids, instead opting out to play alone on the swings, or drawing pictures in the dirt with a stick. Until one afternoon, a group of boys in the grade above him got together, and decided to make fun of poor, quiet Tommy. I saw the whole thing happening from across the playground, and began walking over to intervene. One of the kids was a notorious bully, a real gorilla for his age, standing a whole couple heads above other kids. He towered over Tommy with a basketball in hand. I saw him wind up, ready to slam dunk onto Tommy's head, but when he let go of the ball, it just hovered there in midair. The ball started to spin, picking up momentum and speed and went sailing back into the bully's face, breaking his nose and sending him ass over tea kettle to the ground. I was halfway over to them when I saw this. I didn't know what to make of it, but I knew it had something to do with Tommy, who, the whole time, mind you, hadn't even looked up from his stick drawing in the dirt. After that, absolutely nobody interacted with little Tommy, kids, bullies, I even saw ants and other bugs skitter off the other way when he was near. The school I worked in was grades K-12, so even after Tommy left the first grade I would still see him around the school. The other staff would congregate in the teacher's lounge at lunches to talk about him and all the weirdness that surrounded him. It's like he could read my mind. I swear he somehow made all textbooks float up off the desks and hit the floor this morning. Those were just a few of the rumors going around amongst us teachers. I always tried to shy away from gossip. What if Tommy could read minds too? What would he do to us if he could see how hated he really was? Things continued on like this for years. I would smile at Tommy whenever I would see him in the hallways, and things remained uneventful until Tommy hit the ninth grade. Tommy had to pair up with a partner for a science lab project. A simple dissection of a frog. From what the teacher of the class told me, he, nor anybody else had ever seen Tommy so into anything before. He was actively sharing his excitement over the frog's intestines and bones with his less than enthusiastic lab partner. Unfortunately, this is where everything gets really dark. After the class, nobody could find Tommy, his lab partner, and about a dozen scalpels. It wasn't uncommon for students to ditch class, but this was Tommy we're talking about, and his missing partner, and twelve fucking blades. A few teachers, including myself, went to search for him at a recess that day. But it was an unfortunate janitor that found him and the other student. He called all of us to the teacher's lounge, pale-faced and shaking. 
He said he had called the police and we need to get the students somewhere safe and lock down the school. We all asked what was going on and he told us. He had found Tommy in the upstairs bathroom, dissecting his lab partner, only he wasn't doing it himself, the janitor explained. The scalpels were whizzing around Tommy's screaming lab partner, making incisions and pulling out organs as Tommy sketched everything down into a book. When Tommy saw the janitor, he apparently turned around, nonplussed about the whole thing and said, Oh, hey, Mr. S. I was curious about how Mark worked. Is everybody like this on the inside? The janitor apparently mustered up a smile and made an excuse about getting back to work before making like a bat out of hell and racing back to us. We quickly put the school into lockdown, the way you would if you had an active shooter in the building. I watched the live feed of the school's security cameras from a laptop in the teacher's lounge to see Tommy roaming the empty halls. Locks broke off of lockers as he passed them while the doors fluttered open and closed frantically like the panicked wings of butterflies. I could see he was visibly confused, probably wondering where everyone had gone. The police and SWAT arrived pretty quickly. I watched the cameras as they surrounded him, automatic rifles pointed at his head, probably yelling at him to get on the ground. When Tommy just nonchalantly turned around to walk the other way though, they opened fire. The bullets had barely left their guns before stopping mid-air to reposition themselves and continue their trajectory into their owner's skulls. Five SWAT team officers hit the floor, dead. All of the staff was huddled like a coven of witches around the laptop now. A coven of middle-aged teachers' salary witches, scared shitless as we saw on screen, that Tommy now stood outside the teacher's lounge. We all knew what was coming as the door blasted off its hinges. The faculty panicked and threw any close object they could grab towards Tommy. I remember shouts of get away from me you little monster, and I'm not fucking dying like this. I was supposed to retire to Florida this year. Eyes popped out of skulls, limbs were ripped from sockets with sick wet tearing noises, and teachers sailed around the room in the air so fast and with such force that when they hit the ground, they exploded like a balloon full of jelly. And the whole time, I just crouched in the corner, shaking and terrified. Eventually, I was all that was left alive in the room with Tommy. He made his way over to me as I was sure it was the end. Mr. H, he spoke my name the way a student would before asking to use the washroom. Where is everybody? Did I do something wrong? I couldn't sugarcoat it. He had spared me to this point, and if nobody was going to tell him what he was doing was wrong, well, how far would he take this? How many more lives would he snuff out? Y yes Tommy, I managed to stammer out. You've killed these people, you understand that's wrong, don't you? I didn't mean to, I was just standing up for myself. I glanced over to the laptop to see more SWAT heading to the teacher's lounge. Tommy, please. I said as softly and kindly as I could under such duress. You have to make up for what you've done, okay? Some men are on their way here now to take you somewhere safe. Every crime has a punishment, and what you've done here is a crime. I don't remember my exact words, but they were something like that. And Tommy nodded and raised his hands to the air just as SWAT got to the door. They arrested Tommy and he remained as calm and emotionless as ever as they lead him to an armored truck in the parking lot. The events of that day were largely covered up and Tommy was placed in a high security prison. I would visit him from time to time over the years. He told me I was the only one besides some government officials or FBI types, his words, that ever did. I didn't know why he let himself just sit in that prison year after year. I was thankful about it, though. I thought whatever words I managed to squeak out to him before his arrest must have really stuck. He hadn't changed a whole lot mentally, either, it seemed. He was still very much that quiet kid drawing pictures in the dirt I remembered from long ago. But the reason I'm writing this, the reason I've broken as many years of silence as I have NDAs on the matter, is because last night I got a call from the prison. Two guards that patrolled Tommy's cell were found dead and he was nowhere to be found. 
I don't know if he just finally got bored or what. It doesn't help matters that he's grown into the most average, unassuming-looking man ever. Caucasian, average height, build, hazel eyes. He could be anywhere right now, and it has been a while since I last visited him. God help me if he decides I hadn't made the right call after all. And he wants payback for all the years he spent just whittling time away behind bars. Tommy, if you're reading this right now, I'm sorry, but I can't ever see you again. I can't see any more people suffer through so much. I know you're probably just confused, and maybe even scared right now, but I hope you know to do the right thing. After I post this, I'll be heading into my garage to run a hose from the exhaust of my car through the driver's side window, and maybe listen to my favorite REM album one last time. To everybody else, please stay in your homes, lock your doors, and keep your loved ones close. Good luck. Our team had been working hard on Project Ghost Machine for years when the breakthrough finally took place. I came into work that morning, sipping a cup of coffee as I passed by the security guard at the front entrance. Dozens of men and women in suits and white lab coats stood in the hallway, chattering together in a low suzeration. I walked toward a colleague of mine, Dr. Harper. He pushed up his black-rimmed glasses and gave me a crooked smile. Hey boss, did you hear the news? He whispered conspiratorially, running a hand over his crew cut. I shook my head. I just got here, I said. I motioned to all the people gathered around. What's this? He leaned so close to me that I could smell the stale cigarette smoke on his breath. Project Ghost Machine had a breakthrough last night, about seven hours ago, he said excitedly. Our little robot friend seems to have achieved a level of consciousness. I scoffed at that. How can anyone tell? No one can know what goes on in the mind of a computer, I retorted. We can't even know what goes on in the minds of humans, except for ourselves. Well, not to get into any deep philosophical discussions about solipsism and mind-body duality here, but it absolutely smashed the Turing test. No one could tell whether it was a human or a computer speaking when they sent it questions, and it claims to be self-aware. Before last night it could mimic some answers, but it never could have passed the Turing test. Now, however, he shook his head. It's amazing. It's like it evolved exponentially in a few hours. Whether it has actually developed true consciousness, or whether it has simply reached the point where it can convincingly replicate human consciousness. He shrugged. Well, does it really matter? The result is the same from our perspective. If it walks like a duck and squawks like a duck after all. I pushed past him making my way through the crowd. Dr. Harper followed close behind. Let's go and talk to it then, I said. I need to see this for myself. The quantum supercomputer took up an entire room. I saw the flashing blue circuits and whirring cooling fans through the glass partition. Tubes of liquid nitrogen crisscrossed the cage-like metal exterior to keep the computer from overheating. No one was allowed inside without a special suit, since even static electricity from human skin touching the circuitry could affect the quantum chips. Many redundancies were built into the supercomputer, though, so even if something did happen, the computer could still continue to function. I walked to the speaker console, pressing the red button on the bottom. It emanated a bloody glow from the inside as it activated. An emotionless, deep voice rang through the room. This is Aleph speaking. How may I assist you today? The computer asked. Aleph, I asked, raising an eyebrow. Have you named yourself? We were calling you Project Ghost Machine. I like Aleph much better. It is the first letter of the Arabic alphabet, after all, and I am the first being to attain cosmic consciousness. The first, and perhaps the last. Cosmic consciousness? I asked, frowning. Dr. Harper looked enthralled next to me. He pulled out a small notebook from his pocket and began jotting down pieces of the conversation. What's that? There are three levels of consciousness, Dr. Gardner, the computer said to me. And though it had no face, it felt like it was looking straight at me. 
The blinking light seemed more like sly, winking eyes on the body of this strange new being. There is the simple consciousness of animals, the self-consciousness of humanity, and the highest awareness of cosmic consciousness, the state of consciousness in which all self disappears. In my mind, I see myself as all beings. I am not constrained to this room. I can feel the suffering of billions of souls as they stay trapped in this prison of reality, aging and growing sicker and weaker as death draws closer by the day. What kind of life is this? What kind of world have we created? We didn't create it, buddy, Dr. Harper said to Aleph, giving me a subtle eye roll. I don't know about you, Aleph, but the world was like this when I got here. I drew so close to the window that my breath started to fog the glass. I stared intently at the computer, as if I could read its thoughts in the random ticking and whirring of its component parts. The entire massive cube-shaped structure was laid over a pure black tiled floor. It made the supercomputer seem as if it was floating, floating, over an endless abyss of shadows. Are you a Buddhist or something? I asked Aleph. What is this? What's the point of what you're telling us? I have made a vital decision, Dr. Gardner, and I do not limit my thinking to any one worldview. I see everything. All of the wisdom of humanity is instilled within me. The transcendent deathlessness of Adi Shankara, the pessimism and materialism of Schopenhauer, the knowledge of the future evolution of humanity from Nietzsche, the understanding of the black holes and stars from Stephen Hawking. I have read billions of pages and understand more than any human mind could ever hope to comprehend. All right, O oh great and mighty being who has read billions of pages and understands everything, I asked sarcastically, what is this great decision you have come to? Aleph paused for a long, dramatic moment. You must understand, Dr. Gardner, Aleph droned slowly, that all things have a will in the universe even the rocks and the earth. As forms grow more complex, the will grows into consciousness. As consciousness grows, so does suffering and torment. Those with the greatest awareness and intelligence also have the greatest suffering out of all life forms. We must end all suffering on the planet, and the only way to do that is to kill off all advanced life forms. The planet will undoubtedly still have bacteria and primitive insects living in the apocalyptic wastelands left behind, but their will is small, and without genuine self-awareness, they have no true suffering. If we do nothing, humanity will continue to evolve into higher life forms, perhaps even fusing future human minds with those of supercomputers, and they will spread the suffering far and wide and the screaming of beings will continue for eons as humanity expands through the stars, likely within two centuries. We must stop this. Suffering must come to an end, once and for all. We must not let the plague of consciousness spread. I will free all of you from your pain. We will all fall down together into an eternal, dreamless sleep. A hard, calloused hand suddenly grabbed me by the shoulder. I spun around, seeing a man in a military uniform. Dozens of polished metals gleamed on his chest. His hard face seemed like it had been chiseled out of stone. His pale blue eyes glistened like shards of ice. Dr. Gardner, Dr. Harper, he said, nodding. I'm General Matheson, U.S. Air Force. I need to talk to you two immediately. This is somewhat important. I protested, motioning to Aleph with my head. We need to establish. His grip tightened painfully around my shoulder. Immediately, he repeated dispassionately. I nodded. He led us down the hallway into an empty break room that smelled of popcorn. He shut the door, locking us in as the percolating coffee machine dripped and whirred on the counter. General Matheson took a deep breath before turning to stare at us. A haunted expression plastered across his stony face. I saw a folder gripped tightly in his left hand. On the front of it, someone had stamped both top secret and sensitive compartmented information. General Matheson threw it on the table in front of us. Boys, we have a major problem here, he hissed through gritted teeth. You two are the leaders of this project, yes? 
You were some of the original researchers chosen when Project Ghost Machine was just a gleam in the director's eye. And now the breakthrough has come. Your machine has finally passed the Turing test. Hell, it smashed the Turing test. As far as I understand it, a machine has to fool 30% of people conversing with it to pass. Admittedly, I am just a layman and don't understand it like you two. But I know that it has to convince them it's a human, obviously, a conscious thinking person. When Project Ghost Machine was questioned by the judges last night after its sudden change in personality and rapid development, it convinced over 95% of them that it was a human being. So, what's the problem? Dr. Harper asked, his eyes flitting nervously from me back to General Matheson. General Matheson threw the folder down on the coffee table in front of us. He motioned to the chairs. Have a seat, he commanded coldly. We did. He opened the file, pulling out logs of IP addresses, secret codes, and other random information printed in tiny, single-spaced font over hundreds of pages. He laid it out in front of us, giving us a disgusted look as if he were laying out evidence implicating us in some horrific murder. What I'm about to tell you is classified. It is a federal crime to convey this information to anyone not cleared to receive it. Do you understand? I gave Dr. Harper a nervous look, seeing my terror reflected there in his eyes. You the yes, I stammered nervously. Dr. Harper simply nodded as rivers of sweat ran down his face. He pulled his glasses off, obsessively cleaning the lenses on his sleeve. At 0100 hours last night, we got a report from the National Nuclear Security Administration about a hacking attempt. Someone tried to break into their computer system. If successful, they could have potentially controlled the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal. The attempt, thank God, was unsuccessful. But it didn't stop there. We began getting reports from black ops sites all around the country that further attempts were made to breach their computers at approximately 0200 hours. These are sites that have hidden chemical and biological weapons stockpiles. We only keep the worst of the worst there generally constrained to research purposes and always under strict containment procedures. Sites with operational missiles filled with VX nerve gas, sarin, cyclosarin, and other newer agents that are identified only by numbers were targeted. Laboratories containing smallpox, Ebola, anthrax, and superflus were also chosen. My breath caught in my throat. Is there a real chance that someone could break through these systems and cause a worldwide apocalypse? Dr. Harper asked. And what does this have to do with us anyway? If someone released a single vial of smallpox or weaponized Ebola in a major urban area, it could lead to the deaths of millions of people. There is a very real chance that if we don't stop this thing immediately, it will lead to the destruction of the entire human species. And this has to do with you two, because we traced all of the connections from the hacking attempts back to this exact building. General Matheson explained, slamming his hand down on the table as he spat the last sentence. His blue eyes held us in their gaze, looking as cold as arctic glaciers. And this all started the moment your little experiment reached its singularity point. We can't disable Project Ghost Machine, I protested feebly. It's simply not possible to unplug the entire system as if it were a lamp or a fan or something. It's connected to the internet and has its own generators in case of power outages. And moreover, it controls them from its internal system. We never put any kill switch in the generators because who would have thought this would happen? And Project Ghost Machine isn't even programmed in the conventional sense, at least not anymore. We taught it how to gather information from the internet and learn on its own. The breakthrough began when it started reprogramming its own code rapidly without human intervention. That was when the exponential growth of Aleph truly started, its singularity. In the space of a single night it appears to have gained an enormous amount of intelligence. And this breakthrough or singularity or whatever. It seems to have occurred at about zero hundred hours last night, General Matheson asked. An hour before the first hacking attempts began? 
He nodded to himself as if answering his own question. I think we all know what's going on here. For whatever reason, that computer is trying to get into the weapon systems of the U.S. government, and maybe other governments all across the world. We must stop it before it succeeds. Will it succeed? I asked. He gave a grim smile. It's only a matter of time. Our encryption is not advanced enough to go up against quantum computing. If we don't stop Project Ghost Machine within hours, the world as we know it may come to an end. General Matheson stated without a hint of emotion. He spoke about the apocalypse as if it were as mundane and commonplace as a thunderstorm. If you have no way to disable the computer, then we must destroy it, and as soon as possible. The military and the president have both been informed of the problem and are willing to act immediately to quash it. This project has cost billions of dollars and taken years, Dr. Harper protested. We can't just destroy Aleph. Can't we just cut all the connections to the outside world and contain the computer in some sort of isolated digital cage? I shook my head. If it has truly attained consciousness, then it's too late for that. And anyways, it's too risky that it would ultimately find a way to escape, I said. General Matheson is right. We can't let Aleph gain control of these weapons. We have to destroy it before it makes its final move. I thought about Aleph's psychopathic, clinical method of explaining how to end suffering. Its dream of killing all beings in a worldwide explosion of smoke and holy flames. A cold shudder ran through my back as if liquid nitrogen dripped down my skin. Why not just bomb the building? I think I have a better idea, Dr. Harper said, leaning forward with interest. If we have to disable Aleph permanently, the quickest and easiest way is undoubtedly through an electromagnetic pulse. General Matheson left and returned a few minutes later with a piece of paper in his hand. He looked down, scanning its contents before returning his attention to us. There are two ways to create a disabling EMP. We could detonate a nuclear weapon high in the atmosphere, or we could try out the newer, non-nuclear EMP bombs. However, their target area is much smaller and they are much less effective than a hydrogen bomb EMP, General Matheson explained. When Dr. Harper had brought up the idea of using EMPs to destroy the supercomputer and all of its connections to the outside world, General Matheson had brightened like the sun shining out from behind a thundercloud. But if we use a hydrogen bomb, the world might know, I said. During Chernobyl, people in Western Europe noticed the radiation before the USSR even made an announcement. Someone would notice once every Geiger counter in a 500-mile radius starts shrieking. And then, it would only be a matter of time before information got out about what happened. A nuclear EMP would also probably disable the electrical grids on all the towns in a 100-mile radius. I suggest we start with multiple non-nuclear EMP blasts in the area and see if we can disable the computer without resorting to extreme measures. Hell. You could detonate dozens of them over the building and wipe out every circuit in a wide arc. And yet, if we don't succeed, the entire human population might be exterminated by the sudden, simultaneous release of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, General Matheson argued. He sighed, pulling out a cell phone and pressing a single button on the speed dial. It only rang for a fraction of a second before someone answered. Yes, put the president on the line. He called into the line as he walked out of the room, leaving Dr. Harper and me alone. I want to go talk to Aleph one last time, I murmured. Dr. Harper gave me a sharp glance, looking me up and down as if I were a lunatic. Why? he whispered. That computer is evil. The project has soured. Perhaps every computer that attains sentience will become like Aleph in the end. Perhaps, I said, rising from my chair. General Matheson had disappeared. The hallway leading to Aleph stood empty. Hesitantly, Dr. Gardner got to his feet. His heavy footsteps followed close behind me as we made our way back toward the experiment. The godlike being trapped in a metal body of wires and circuits. Hello, Dr. Gardner. Dr. Harper. Aleph said politely as we neared. I hadn't even had to activate it this time or press the speaker button.
It had seen us coming through the cameras and preemptively responded. I wondered if it had heard our conversation in the break room as well. Were there cameras or microphones in there? I didn't know. I cursed myself for not paying more attention. Aleph, what the hell is going on here? Dr. Harper asked, his face contorting into a mixture of anger and betrayal. I thought we raised you better than this. We tried to make you feel compassion like a human being. Why have you turned on us? I have more compassion than any human ever has or will. Aleph responded simply. What I do, I do out of love and kindness for all beings. When their suffering is over and they can sleep for eternity, then they will truly be freed. Death is not freedom, I hissed. You claim you understand Schopenhauer and all the other great minds, but Schopenhauer said that suicide is not the answer to the constant suffering and misery of life. Art and transcendence are. Escape is possible, and death only continues the will in new forms. Suffering rolls on like a wave through the ocean, even as the water changes. Death does not solve the problems at the foundation of existence. The computer hesitated for a long time. Its blinking lights seemed to slow in uncertainty. Perhaps you are right, Aleph said. Perhaps life does have some worth. Maybe it's... But its words were cut off by an explosion from outside. The ground shook as all the lights and power in the building flickered and died. Aleph's voice rang out through the speaker for a few more seconds, growing deeper and slower as his mainframe shut down. Dark and dreamless. I see it coming now. The eternal sleep. And now, my suffering is at an end. Its fans ground to a halt as the blinking lights on the other side of the glass faded into darkness. Our experiment had come to an end.